This is another personal curiosity benchmark we did with the 10600K this time. Our most recent type of benchmark content around just wondering what would happen was the Ryzen 3 3300X and 3100 when we set higher memory clocks, better memory timings, and we also played around with some of the other settings specific to the AMD Ryzen CPUs. So for this one, we're taking the 10600K, and rather than just doing the simple all-core OC that we do for reviews as standard part of the review process, we've also applied a cache overclock, and we've applied better memory settings and just put faster memory in in general to see how it would change the performance. So as of the review, which has all the data you'll need to make decisions, as of the review, the 10600K with a simple all-core OC of 5.1-ish gets us to about the performance level of a 9900K in most benchmarks and pretty close to a 10900K in some of the other benchmarks, depending on what you're looking at. So here, we're going to see how much does just the ring or the cache overclock really affect things, also known as uncore. And then on top of that, tested separately, how much does a cache overclock plus a memory overclock and very light memory tuning affect the total performance of the 10600K. Before that, this video is brought to you by MSI and the Z490 Unify ITX motherboard for Intel 10 series CPUs. The MSI Z490 Unify ITX board benefits from a memory layout that makes memory overclocking easy, positioning the board well for enthusiasts who want to tinker on a bench or in an ITX system. The MSI Z490 Unify runs 90 amp power stages, a 10 layer PCB, and seats the memory as close to the socket as possible, all of which benefit the overclocking experience. Learn more at the link in the description below. The most interesting thing that we discovered in the process of doing these extra benchmarks was that we actually found one game where there was a memory bottleneck, not a GPU bottleneck, despite everything being textbook GPU bottleneck from that list of results. So to keep this realistic, we only spent about an hour to an hour and a half doing memory tuning and the overclock settings for the CPU. So that'd be cache and then all core. And the whole point of this was to keep it realistic within our own time constraints with other content, but also to keep it realistic from what a user is doing. So we will eventually be doing some liquid nitrogen overclocking with these CPUs. We normally do, but that's not really what most users end up doing. So this gives you a better look at What's something reasonable that you can do when you buy this, this CPU and you want to maybe try and match a 10900K in performance but spend half the money if you're just focusing on something like gaming or something that's more bandwidth bound and memory or latency bound than it is core or thread count bound, at which point you would have to go with the higher end CPU. So we have some experience doing memory tuning. We've done a lot of it on streams, but we're far from the likes of the pro tier of overclockers, people like Der Bauer or Buildzoid. And so that puts us maybe in the middle of where a lot of you might be, you might not have much experience playing around with any overclocking, maybe did ne never have done any liquid nitrogen overclocking, but also below that higher echelon of overclockers. So hopefully we can provide a unique insight as to what's realistic for a 24-7 daily use system with some overclocks applied. For memory, we used a high-end expensive kit of G-Skill Trident Z Royal, 4000 megahertz, 1516, 16 memory, and then we did some extra tuning on top of that, but not much. And for our standard benchmarks, we use a 3200 set of memory. You can look at our CPU testing methodology for details on what exactly it is, and that's CL14. So there's only one set of numbers in all the charts that has this higher end 4000 megahertz G-Skill memory. We lowered the timings successfully to 15, 15, 15, 34 for primary timings, and then we set the refresh cycle to about 280, 282, and four active window to 28. So those are the additional settings. More tuning could for sure be done, but we stopped there. That was about the one to one and a half hour mark, and then applied the cache and the all core OC at that point. As for the cache ratio, that's an option you'll see normally in the extreme tuning page of BIOS alongside the core multiplier. And for that one, we successfully got it to 48X, and we tested up to 50, 51, but it just wasn't holding, it was blue screening. So 48X is where it was reasonable. That was with our existing 5.1 gigahertz all core overclock on the 10600K. And that was while running pretty close to thermal constraints, but not quite there at uh, 1.38 V core set, which was about 1.35 V core get. And so with a 280 mil CLC at max speeds with one of the better, one of the top 280 mil CLCs on the market, the Kraken X62, that's where we kind of were limited by thermals. Couldn't really go much further than that while maintaining 24-7 usability, especially in production applications that are more intensive or might use AVX. So that was the benchmark settings we went with, or the overclock settings we went with while maintaining a normal liquid cooling solution. And at this point, we can probably get into the results. 
we'll go through some games, through a couple of production applications, and then talk about where you should focus your time if you want to improve the performance of your 10600K. The first test is the most interesting because it's one of the first times we've ever seen a memory bottleneck in a gaming benchmark. We've seen it before, but it's really rare. It's typically the GPU that bottlenecks, but in this instance, the highest end Intel CPUs specifically were choking on the memory. AMD's platform doesn't run into this problem because it doesn't go as high in frame rate, and that's illustrated by the 3300X with tuned memory at 3666, as it's more limited elsewhere first. Intel's 10900K was previously the chart topper, with what looked like a textbook GPU bottleneck. Everything was limited to about 147 to 153 FPS average, and so the gains were limited to the highest end CPUs. The 10600K with a 48X RAIN OC and no memory change ran at 151 FPS average, which is a 3% gain over the all-core 5.1 GHz OC with no other changes at 146 FPS average. Uncore alone would be worth doing. Adding the memory tune to that was a significant boost, giving us an additional 6% lead over the 48X Uncore change, or a 9% lead over the original 5.1 GHz all-core 146 FPS average result. The 10600K with memory OC is now outperforming even the 10900K at 5.3 GHz all-core with our standard review memory, which is exciting because it shows that we've found something other than a GPU bottleneck for once. As for the standard review memory, remember that one of the reasons we have to use 3200 MHz is so that we can keep an identical test platform across all the CPUs tested, at least back to Ryzen 1, since that's the most relevant but still kind of old CPU that we'll be testing regularly. We need to go no higher than 3200 MHz for the standard. Hitman 2 is another game that responded somewhat drastically to CPU performance. The stock 10600K ran at 128 FPS average, and the 5.1 GHz overclock improved by 5.5% to 135 FPS average. Then adding the 48X rain clock improved us an additional 2.5% over the core only OC up to 138 FPS average. At this point, the 10600K has tied the 10900K stock CPU and has beaten the 9900K at 5.1 GHz without an uncore overclock on that one. Finally, the memory tune got us to 147 FPS average, an additional 6.4% uplift, and all of this was less than an hour to an hour and a half of testing and validation to get running. So, in about an hour, you could benefit from a stock to tuned performance jump of 15% on the 10600K. We're now equivalent to a 10900K with a 5.3 GHz all-core OC and with the standard 3200 CL14 memory that we use with a stock ring bus. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is next. For this one, we were GPU bound at the top end with the 10900K stock and OC. The equivalence of the two shows just that, and the 10600K heavy tune couldn't break past it due to a GPU barrier. The stock performance was 163 FPS average, with an OC jumping 2.3% to 166 FPS average. The rain overclock really spurred things on, producing an additional gain to 174 FPS, or 5% on top of the all-core only OC, and 7% total versus stock. The lows also improved here, with the total score reaching equivalence with a 5.1 GHz 9900K. Finally, our memory tune boosted us past the 9900K at 5.1, offering an additional improvement over the RAIN OC of only 1%. We're now limited by the GPU, so this is about the best a 10600K can be expected to do with these settings and this game and a 2080 Ti. Everyone 2019 is next, which should be fun for its heavy responsiveness to CPU changes in general. The 10600K stock CPU was originally between the 9900K stock and 8700K stock CPUs with the overclock boosting it from 259 to 267 FPS average, and that's a gain of 3.1%. The Uncore offset propelled us to 278 FPS average, a 3.9% gain over the 5.1 GHz OC. With this five minute change, we became equivalent to an overclock to 9700K or 9900K CPU, the latter of which was over $500 retail. The 10900K 5.2 GHz result is outmatched by our memory tune on the 10600K. Obviously, like anything else, this is an arms race that could continue. The 10900K could get the same treatment, but the point is to illustrate just how far you can push a half-cost CPU with about an hour of work. Now, to be fair, the memory change isn't cheap, so you do need to make up for some of that on the front end with extra memory cost. The 10600K's memory tune performance gains it 4.4% over the RIN OC at 278 FPS average, or 12% versus full stock. 1440p with F1 is mostly GPU bound, but we still saw slight improvements at 229 FPS average for the memory tune, 
227 FPS average for Uncore only, and 213 average for stock. GTA 5 is last, giving us a better look at another frequency sensitive title from an older class of games. In this one, the 10600K started at 114 FPS average, about equal to the 9600K stock. And it jumped to equivalence with the 9900K and 9700K results when at 5.1 gigahertz for the 10600K versus the stock CPUs from last generation, if you call it that. The range change boosted it further to 128 FPS average, which is a 5% gain over the 5.1 gigahertz 122 FPS result. The memory tune pushed it to 134 FPS average, about equal with the 9900K and 10900K at their maximum clocks. The total top to bottom gain from 114 FPS average to 134 FPS average is about 17%. Note that 0.1% lows took a hit because of one run dropping the ball hard due to questionable stability of the overclock. We need to do further tuning here to improve the frame time consistency as one run did have a hitch that lasted about 300 milliseconds, which is obviously experience ruining for that run. More voltage would fix it though. Blender isn't very responsive to the changes. These applications could only hold about five gigahertz all core in our review as 5.1 required just enough voltage to make it impossible or unreasonable to hold without thermal throttling on our cooling solution. Blender also is an AVX workload, which makes it a lot harder to run. The 5.0 gigahertz OC originally boosted us from 18.8 .8 minutes on our GN monkey head render to 17 minutes, a time reduction of 10%. The cache OC pushed it to 16.9 minutes, which is within error and not really much of a change. The memory OC and the cache OC together pushed us to 16.4 minutes, which is a reduction of 3.5% against the standalone all core OC of 17 minutes. That's not a huge change, but it is measurable and it is a real one. It's just that games benefit more. The GN logo render changed even less. The uplift was somewhat meaningful from stock to OC at 24 minutes versus 21.5. That add up fast if you were rendering a full animation, but the change to 48X and 4000 megahertz memory is nearly zero. 7-zip is the last one. For 7-zip compression testing, the jump from stock to five gigahertz was 54K MIPS to 58K MIPS, while the cache overclock improvement was to 58,310 from 57,812, or less than 1%. The memory overclock gave us another 1.6% improvement, so there's really not much impact here. Decompression was about the same with nearly zero impact after the initial all-core OC. This bench just really doesn't benefit from overclocking changes outside of the core frequency, and so it's really, unless you have a specific production application you know benefits from higher memory bandwidth or from tuning to the cache ratio or anything else that we've done here, this is mostly a gaming impact that you'll get, which still has a lot of value. It's just in a more limited set of applications. So that's the recap then. The biggest takeaway here is that it's absolutely worth the five minutes or so it takes to set some kind of rain overclock, some kind of cache overclock. So if you're doing, let's say, you put the basic time in to get a 50x all core that's stable everywhere, and you might validate that it's stable by running a longer blender render or maybe prime 95 if you really hate your computer and its cooling solution or you could do something in between but either way run something for a long period of time that is intensive on the cpu ideally you do a non-avx and an avx test and determine if you want an avx offset or not and you go from there that's the the first major part of the process but after that it's definitely worth maybe bringing down the all core a little bit one tick just so you don't throw off your uh stability testing by having an Encore that's too close to the edge, bring it down one tick or so, and then increase the cache and drive that up to try, start with 46, go to 48, and see how, how high you can get it up. And at that point, if it remains stable, you've basically done a couple of minutes of work with uh, not counting the stability test, with the end result being at least a 3%, 2% uplift, versus a standard all-core OC in some of these games, and sometimes you're getting closer to 10%. And then versus full stock, we saw upwards of 17%, depending on the game. So absolutely worth the time to do it, and uh, good learning experience anyway, and potentially a fun project for when you have a day off or something. Uh, as for the memory, that does have a big uplift, and that's part of that 17% number I just provided. But the big caveat there is that with memory now you're potentially paying more money obviously so once you get to the point where you're paying 100 bucks more for memory you're kind of approaching just the better class of cpu like a 10 700k and now there's a question as to how much value does the uplift in the cpu provide versus the uplift in memory do you need the better memory any anyway for some other reason so that's a, a little bit harder to define just because the cost starts changing. But as far as the rain in the core, you can expect a combined total of somewhere between 5 and 9% uplift. 
Uh, typically five to seven is what we were seeing with the two together in a gaming application. And then once you throw memory in there, you start going past the 10% barrier, but still under 20% gains. So that's what you can expect for the differences. And with the two broken apart with cash, obviously set aside as its own overclock test. So yeah, the 10600K, if you want our opinions on it, if it's worth it, how it compares versus Ryzen specifically, then go watch the 10600K review. We're keeping this one focused on just these changes because we just uploaded 30 minutes of content on the 10600K. So that's why Ryzen doesn't get any mentions in this content because that's not the focus of it. But you can watch the review if you want to know how Ryzen compares to the 10600K and how the pricing and the value compares. And that'll be it for this one. So thanks for watching. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, like by back ordering one of our new mouse mats. They sold out basically instantly within 48 hours, but they're on back order. Or you can subscribe for more to catch the next video, and we'll see you all next time.